Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we look to continue our current study, looking at the closing scenes of the book of Daniel, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and for his direction, so that we may more directly and completely understand what is being shown here. Shall we now ask for his guidance and his blessing? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we may assemble together. We thank you for the many blessings that you have been providing. We ask now, Father, for your watch care over Theodore as he travels. We ask for your blessing upon us as we meet together. Show us now that which you would have us to understand. Direct us in all things. Help us so that what how we discuss and what we discuss may be according to your will. Be with us now. We ask, we thank you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, I don't have a copy of the work papers that we had been going through. So I went back and I began looking at different items. What's before you right now is a copy of the final portion of what Uriah Smith <clears throat> would have used by 1897 in his book, Thoughts on Daniel. Now, when we keep in mind that Smith had been working on this document for something close to 30 years, and that this document has been changed multiple times by the church, it helps us to understand that, first, there can be a progression in the way that these things are being approached, but the other issues are that there can also be revisionist changes. So we're going to take a look and we're going to, we're going to go through several of the, of the verses. Now I'll make these documents available so that we can address them privately and then be able to address them also as we study. Now my understanding is that we're going to study without Theodore today and tomorrow. And hopefully he'll feel up to doing the study on Wednesday. <clears throat> but in case not, we'll have these other documents to work through. Now, as I recall, we had, we were getting close to the end of the book of Daniel. So I'm going to scroll this down roughly to about verse nine, and then we'll go through these last four verses. Now, were there any thoughts <clears throat> based upon the the meeting that we had yesterday. Okay, now I'll scroll back up here just a little bit. Smith combined his understanding of verse 5, 6, and 7 into one discussion type of paragraphs. So at verse 5, then I, Daniel, looked and beheld, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on the that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Now, we are looking at this as a present truth application and looking to rightly divide the word of truth in this matter. So, Smith, the question, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Undoubtedly has reference to all that previously been mentioned, including the standing up of Michael, the time of trouble and the deliverance of God's people and the special and antecedent resurrection of verse 2. Now, is Smith right in his premise on this question? Specifically, should he be looking still that the standing up of Michael is the first thing in this line, because it would seem that he is accepting the standing up of Michael as being in perfect order. Are these items, prophetic items, that are addressed in the Bible always in their direct order. 
No, they're not. Okay. Now, Smith continues, and the answer seems to be given in two divisions. First, a specific prophetic period is marked off. Secondly, an indefinite period follows before the conclusion of all these things reached, just as we have in chapters 8, 13, and 14. When the question was asked how long the vision to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot, the answer mentioned a definite period of 2,300 days, and then a definite period of the cleansing of the sanctuary. So in the text before us, there is given a period of time, times and a half, or 1,260 years, and then an indefinite period for the continuance of the scattering of the power of the holy people before the consummation. Now, does this make sense? Does Smith's point make sense? Should he be linking this to definite and indefinite periods? Well, Dr. 2300 come to a definite point. Yes, it does. Well, the 2520 as well, don't it? I would agree. Now, let's right, remember. Please. Go ahead, please. I would agree with it, then. Well, I guess what, I, what I'm saying here is Smith is trying to say that there would have to be a defined period followed by an indefinite period. He's leaving it very open. Well, what does he mean by indefinite? A period that is not defined numerically. Is Smith struggling to make sense of this verse? What do you think? Smith continues here. The 1,260 years mark the period of papal supremacy. Why is this period here introduced? Probably because this power is the one which does more than any other in world's history towards scattering the power of the holy people or oppressing the church of God. Now, Smith is saying that the 1,260 years is introduced in Daniel 12. Is he right? Is Smith correct that the 1,260 days is introduced in Daniel 12? I would think so because it's inside the 1335. Okay. So let me ask you this question. If we were to look at Daniel 813, this verse reads, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? What is the vision of the daily and the transgression of desolation? How do we look at that? This vision spoken of in Daniel 8.13 is the calzone, right? Is this not the panoramic vision? Is this different from the vision of the evening, morning that we address later in the chapter? The point that I'm trying to drive home. Daniel 8.13 introduces through the calzone vision the concept that there is a dividing of the calzone vision into two periods of 1,260 days. The daily, which Miller saw as paganism, was one period of 1260. The transgression of desolation is the second period of 1260. Thereby, the calzone is representative of the 2520, the seven times. So, Smith's point that the 1260 is introduced in Daniel 12 would be incorrect. Now, does is it correct to say that probably because this power is the one that does more than any other in world history towards scattering the power of the holy people or oppressing the church of God? Yes, but it's not introduced in Daniel 12. It is supported in Daniel 12. Now, it's interesting to me that here Smith 
comes back to use what he says is a literal translation of the Septuagint, stating, when he shall have finished the scattering of the power of the holy people. To whom does the pronoun he refer? According to the wording of scripture, the antecedent would at first seem to be him that liveth forever, or Jehovah. But as an eminent expositor of the prophecies judiciously remarks, in considering the pronouns of the Bible, we are to interpret them according to the facts of the case, and hence must frequently refer to them to an antecedent understood rather than some noun that is expressed. So here the little horn or man of sin, having been introduced by the particular mention of the time of his supremacy, may be the power referred to by the pronoun he. After his supremacy is taken away, his disposition toward the truth and its advocate still remain, and his power is still felt to a certain extent, and he continues to work of oppression just as far as he is able. Till when? Till the last of the events brought to view in verse 1, the deliverance of God's people, everyone that is found written in the book. Being thus delivered, persecuting powers are no longer able to oppress them. Their power is no longer scattered. The end of the wonders described in this great prophecy is reached, and all its predictions are accomplished. Here again, Smith is trying to press more that Daniel 12, 1 must occur before all of the rest of this does occur. Yet, the standing up of Michael is symbolizing that there would soon be a change. We are seeing that here is the events that would have to take place. When Christ stands up, his bride has made herself ready for the wedding. The church is ready for his second coming. Now, here Smith continues making use of different verses because he wants to support the premise that he's understood. His understanding would be that the church must first be disciplined to purify and make white his people. How long? Until the sanctuary is cleansed. Now, when we come to these other verses, verses 8, 9, and 10, And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now, was this section of verses fulfilled during the time that Smith had been presenting Daniel, the thoughts on Daniel, in his books? What it was fulfilled in the Millerite history? I don't know that Daniel 12 was fulfilled in the Millerite history. I think it might have been partially fulfilled, but I don't think it was completely fulfilled. And if you think it was, please help me understand. I can't right now. I'm kind of driving. But, uh, let's see. Um, now, it's interesting that Smith would write this sentence. How little were some of the prophets permitted to understand of what they wrote? It's interesting to me that Smith would take this kind of an attitude. He continued, but they did not therefore refuse to write. If God required it, they knew that in due time, he would see that his people derived from their writings all the benefit that he intended. So the language here used to Daniel was the same as telling him that when the right time should come, the wise would understand the meaning of what he had written and be profited thereby. The time of the end was the time in which 
the Spirit of God was to break the seal from off this book. And consequently, this was the time during which the wise should understand, while the wicked lost to all sense of the value of eternal truth, with hearts callous and hardened in sin, would grow continually more wicked and more blind. None of the wicked understand. The efforts which the wise put forth to understand, they call folly and presumption and ask in sneering phase, where is the promise of his coming? Now, are we seeing this currently within the movement? Hey, Brother Dwight, yes. uh, are you in chapter 12 of Daniel? Yes, I am. Chapter 12, verse 10. Verse 10, okay. Now, what, what I'm reading from is Uriah Smith's Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, page 340. The reason I went to this, the reason I was led to go to this, is that there's quite a number of sentiments that have been running through the church, through the movement, about what this has been saying. The points that we've been studying <clears throat> from the well, work... I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. Dwight. If, you, if you're talking about verse 10, that ain't been fulfilled yet, has it? I would have to agree that it hasn't been fulfilled yet. I'm much in agreement with that. Yeah, it says, many shall be purified and made white, tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. That's the end of probation, right? That is definitely the end of probation. Okay. So if we, if, if, if brother, we were to look at verse one of Daniel 12, has Michael stood up? No. No, he has not. So this process of verse 10, where many shall be purified, this is an active statement. We can only be purified when our characters are becoming more like Christ. Would that be agreed? Yes, sir. Can we be purified after Christ has stood up? No, you cannot. It's over with. So at this point, verse 10 is referring to an active process that is occurring before Michael stands up. Would that be correct? Here again, verse 1 is showing us the ultimate conclusion. Verse 10 is showing us what leads up to that conclusion. Smith, on page 341 states, the phraseology of verse 10 seems to be at first sight to be rather peculiar. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. How, it may be asked, can they be made white and then tried, as the language would seem to imply, when it is being tried that they are purified and made white? Answer, the language doubtless describes a process which is many times repeated in the experience of those who, during this time, are being made ready for the coming and the kingdom of the Lord. They are purified and made white to a certain degree, as compared with their former condition. Then they are again tried. Greater tests are brought to bear upon them. If they endure these, the work of purification is thus carried on to still a greater extent. The process of being made white is made to reach a still higher stage. And having reached this state, they are tried again, resulting in their being still further purified and made white. And thus the process goes on till characters are developed, which will stand the test of the great day, and a spiritual condition is reached which needs no further trial. In this statement, is is Smith correct? Yes, I would say he is. Okay, so all we're all we are looking at then here is Smith's understanding of placing verse one and the event of verse one ahead of the events of verse ten as being incorrect. Because not everything presented in the Bible occurs in its exact chronological 
order. So here, in verse 11, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Does this place the 1,290 days within the time period of the seven times of Leviticus 26? Yes, it does, because it's, it's the... The 1335 ends in 14, 1843, right? Correct. So the um, 1290. I know it's hard to, to visualize this without kind of a whiteboard. You're right, because I, I, I'm driving a truck, and I, I'm trying to figure out, <laughs> in my, I'm trying to picture it in my head. Because <laughs> okay, so here again, verse 11 is supporting what we read from Daniel 8.13. From the time that the daily shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate, or as Daniel 8.13 calls it, the transgression of desolation. We would have this showing to us that from 723 to 508 A.D., is a time where the daily had sway and then was taken away. The 1290 would begin in 508. And when we add 1290 to 508, would we not come to 1798? I apologize, Dwight. I, it's, I, I had a brain freeze. I forgot to, to 1798. Okay. It's it's okay, brother. I mean, we've, we've got a lot of things that are going on right now. I know what it's like to try to puzzle through some of this while I'm driving. So the point that you were making is correct. This 1290 would need to begin in 508. We have 30 years from 508 to 538. Why is that 30-year period important? What does it symbolize? The rise of the papacy. The rise of the papacy in order that they may become the false priests to the world, right? And that was supported in the chat. Thank you. Now, here's our situation. All of these periods are being presented within a period of seven times. The seven times is a structure that is important for us to understand and that Smith himself had set aside. The seven times provides primary witness to the importance of that time frame. Now, here we are with Smith's comment, we have here a new prophetic period introduced, namely 1,290 prophetic days, which should denote the same number of literal years. Isn't it interesting that Smith is so willing to address the 1,290 as being literal years, but was willing to set aside the 2,520 as also being literal years. From the reading of the text, some have inferred, though the inference is not a necessary one, that this period begins with the setting up of the abomination of desolation or papal power in 538 and consequently extends to 1828. But while we find nothing in the latter year to mark its termination, we do find evidence in the margin that it begins before the setting up of the papal abomination. So the margin reads, to set up the abomination, with this reading, the text would stand thus. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away to set up, or in order to set up the abomination that maketh desolate, 
there shall be 1,290 days. The daily has already been shown to be not the daily sacrifice of the Jews, but the daily or the continual abomination that is paganism. Here, Smith refers to chapter 813. If we are correctly dividing this, Daniel 813 concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation should be two periods each of 1,260 years. Had this been taken away to prepare the way for the papacy, for the historical event showing how this was accomplished in 508, see regarding chapter 1131. We are not told directly to what these, to what event these 12,000 or 1,290 days reach. But inasmuch as their commencement is marked by a work which takes place to prepare the way for setting up of the papacy, it would be most natural to conclude that their end would be marked by the cessation of papal supremacy. He takes the 1290 back from 1798 to come to 508. We are looking at 508 coming 30 years forward and beginning the 1260 at that time. So, our situation right now would be that just as we have looked at periods of 126 and 252 in relation to the seven times, can 129 also have an import for our consideration as in 129 days or 129 years. What would you think? Smith continued, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thou thy way till the end shall be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. So here again, Smith comes Still another prophetic period is here introduced, denoting 1,335 years. The testimony concerning this period, like that which pertains to the 1,290 years, is very meager. Can we tell when this period ends? The only clue we have to the solution of this question is the fact that it is spoken of in immediate connection with the 1,290 years, which commenced as shown above in 508. So, Smith connects this with 1843. Did any of you observe the chart that Brother Stephen had presented on the WhatsApp chat? This chart had a direct reference to the 1,335 days. Okay, so because you've been quiet, I'm going to read some of this from this chart. Stephen had presented the 1,335 years, and he placed an endpoint in agreement with part of what Smith is stating here. Because the last paragraph of this, <clears throat> last portion of this paragraph reads, Unless they are able to be reckoned from this point, namely 508, it is impossible to locate them, and they must be accepted from the prophecy of Daniel when we apply to it the words of Christ. He who readeth, let him understand. From this point, they would extend to 1843, for 1,335 added to 508, make 1843. Commencing in the spring of the former year, they ended in the spring of the latter. Now, on this chart, Stephen has placed 1,335 years with an ending date of the 19th of April of 1844. So, if that I think it's the same date is uh, is um, eighteen forty three April nineteenth eight 
They take the same day. Don't they meet right there? That's I, what I'm trying to say. I, I understand. Don't they meet right there? I would say that that's, that's quite possible. Now, I'll try to bring this up. Thank you for posting that chart. Okay. It's the first day of the first month. Too. Yes, it is the first day of the first month of 1844. That's correct. Now, what I found intriguing of this was that when Brother Stephen used the Julian calendar and he looked at the 11th of August of 1840, the date in which the Ottoman supremacy failed. And he took 1,335 days. That also brought us to the first day of the first month of 1844. So not only do we have 1,335 years terminating at that point, we have 1,335 days terminating at that point. Is this, as Smith is trying to say, about this period, a meager testimony? Or is this a powerful testimony? What do you think? Throughout this, we have multiple references, not only to the 1335, but also to 1290. All of these things being interlinked. I think it's awesome. Okay. I mean, God has made it where you can't have no excuse. Agreed. So in this in this situation, we have the thirteen thirty five, the twelve ninety, the twelve sixty, and the twenty five twenty all interlinked within this portion of prophecy. Would you agree? Amen. Okay. Now here, Smith goes, how can it be that they have ended? It may be asked, since the end of these days, Daniel stands in his lot, which is by some supposed to refer to his resurrection from the dead. His question is founded on a misapprehension in two aspect, in two respects. First, that the days at the end which Daniel stands in his lot are the 1335 days. And secondly, that the standing of Daniel in his lot is his resurrection, which also cannot be sustained. The only thing promised at the end of the 1335 days is a blessing unto those who wait and come to that time, that is, those who are then living. What is this blessing? Looking at the year 1843, then these years expired. What do we behold? We see a remarkable fulfillment of prophecy in the great proclamation of the second coming of Christ. Forty-five years before this, the time of the end commenced. The book was unsealed and light began to increase. About the year 1843, there was a grand culmination of all the light that had been shed on prophetic subjects up to that time. The proclamation went forth in power. The new and stirring doctrine of the setting up of the kingdom of God shook the world. New life was imparted to the true disciples of Christ. The unbelieving were condemned. The churches were tested. And a spirit of revival was awakened, which has had no parallel since. Now, this was the, these are the points that Smith was pressing in his book, Thoughts on Daniel, that was originally part of a Sabbath school study that he had done. Now, at that time, in 1843, William Miller's message had been going out for a period of five years because people really started listening to what he was saying at the time that they made 
this proclamation regarding the fall of the Ottoman Empire about 1838. We know that Miller had been giving his message beginning about 1833, because this would apply with what we've seen with the Feast of Trumpets, where the 10 days of the Feast of Trumpets became the 10 years of Miller's message to the world. Then in 1844, the Day of Atonement began. This feast, this sixth feast, was to have been for a day, but has continued since October 22nd, 1844. <clears throat> It has not been a determined time. Now, here we have been trying to have a, a present truth application. Our situation from the studies that have been ongoing have been to try to apply so much of this with what has been occurring within our lives, within the movement, and within the church. Have we seen many that have been vocal about believing the messages in the movement walk away? Has the movement as a whole been being tested? And has a spirit of revival yet awakened within the movement? I want to say not a... I don't see a spirit of revival happening yet. Okay. Have have we individually been being tested? Yeah, definitely. It's not an easy process, is it? No. No. And it's not always pleasant. Not always pleasant. But the latter end is, is a blessing, you know, when you overcome things. Now... Was it pleasant for the disciples to watch Christ ascend into heaven? I would say no. Uh, kind of a bittersweet kind of thing. How was it for them to have to join in the upper room to come together confessing their sins to one another and praying? Okay, now, comment from from the chat. That makes a notation about 1,477 days. That the 1,477 days divide by 7 brings us to 211, which was another witness to Stephen's date of birth. Now, I'm going to see if I can get this other to come up good. Okay, let's see if this will work. I will see. There we go. Okay. Now, is this coming through clearly? Can you can you now see this chart? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. This is what Stephen had shared on the WhatsApp. So, from 321 AD, the Sunday Law of Constantine to the close, the deadly wound upon the papacy, you have a period of 1,477 years. In this time frame, you have a period of 187 years from 321 to 508. 187, of course, the number using July 18th. And this takes us to 508 A.D., the 30 years where the abomination which maketh desolate is set up takes us to 538. And that, combined with the 1260, gives us a, a period of 1,290 years. Now, beginning in 508, we would come 1,335 years to the first day of the first month or the 19th of April of 1844. We have 1,335 days from the 11th of August of 1840 on the Julian calendar 
until that first day of the first month, biblically, April 19th of 1844. We have 1,290 days from the seventh day of the 10th month on the Gregorian calendar, which is also the 10th day of the seventh month of the biblical calendar of 1840. 1,290 days brings us right to that first day of the first month. In the midst of this, we have the 11th day of the ninth month on the Julian calendar, and the 11th day, it says here, the 11th day of the eighth month on the biblical calendar of 1840. But it brings us again to a period of 1,260 days. Then when we're looking, 187 days brings us to the 10th day of the 7th month of the biblical calendar or October 22nd, 1844, which again is a period of 1,477 days. It's like a prophetic mirror here. It is. It's like a mirror. Now, is this by chance that this happens? No. I can't can't see it by chance. Can man make this happen? No, this is definitely Palmoni. So all of these numbers, all of this interrelationship, it's not a week. It's not happenstance. This is something that is well supported in all that we have been studying and all that we are under, that, that we're looking to understand at this point. Now, the other thing that I noticed from what, from what Stephen had presented, he was doing a very simple mathematical presentation. Did any of you see his brief presentation regarding Fahrenheit and Celsius? Yeah, I saw that on WhatsApp. So it was intriguing for me, and I, I shared this with another brother on Sabbath, because if you have 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit, and you look to convert that to Celsius, you wind up with the Celsius reading of 1,260. (laughs) And it's it's absolutely shocking when we look at this. I mean, yeah, how God is involved. Exactly. It's amazing. (laughs) And that brings us to the uh, 187, darling. Yes, it does. How many different ways does God need to come to us to tell us to pay attention. He's done it every which way, every which way, you know. <laughs> can, we, can we afford to ignore what he is saying here? Uh, there's no way. There's no way we can ignore this. We ignore it at our peril. Now, I'm going to return to the first document. Now, Smith, as he continued, he gives he gives the notation back here. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred five and thirty days. What is this blessing? Listen to the Savior's word. Blessed are your eyes, said he to his disciples, for they see and your ears for they hear. And again, he told his followers, the prophets and the kings had desired to see the things that which they saw and have not seen them. But blessed, he said to them, are the eyes which see the things that ye see. If a new and glorious truth was a blessing in the days of Christ to those who received it, why was it not equally so in 1843? Why was it equally so? In 1844. Now his comment here. It may be objected. That those who engaged in this movement. 
were disappointed in their expectations. So were the disciples of Christ at his first advent in an equal degree. They shouted before him as he rode into Jerusalem, expecting that he would then take the kingdom. But the only throne to which he then went was the cross. And instead of being hailed as a king in a royal palace, he was laid a lifeless form in Joseph's new sepulcher. Nevertheless, they were blessed in receiving the truths which they had heard. Now, as this was written in 1897, do we not have the digits of 18th of July involved in the year in which this particular portion was published? Were we not disappointed? Was the movement not disappointed? personally disappointed with the events as they took place on July 18th. Smith continued, it may be objected further that this was not a sufficient blessing to be marked by a prophetic period. Why not, since the period in which it was to occur, namely the time of the end, is introduced by a prophetic period, since our Lord, in verse 14 of the great prophecy of Matthew 24, makes a special announcement of this movement. And since it is still further set forth in Revelation 14, 6, and 7 under the symbol of the angel flying through mid-heaven with a special announcement of the everlasting gospel to the inhabitants of the earth, surely the Bible gives great prominence to this movement. Two more questions remain to be briefly noticed. What days are referred to in verse 13? And what is meant by Daniel standing in his lot? Now, Smith places the 1335 as a continuation and explanation of the vision of chapter 8. Hence, we may say that in the vision of chapter 8, as carried out and explained, there are four prophetic periods, namely the 2300, the 1260, the 1290, and the 1335. What period is being ignored here? Well, I don't see a 2520. Right. Now, comment from the chat was that 1897 was Tennessee's centennial. 1897 is 1798 scrambled. Goddess of reason worshipped during the French Revolution goddess of wisdom placed as an idol in the Parthenon in Nashville. Of these periods, of these prophetic periods, isn't it interesting that we can point right now to five prophetic periods? And of course, the number five means nothing to us, right? It doesn't matter that we can speak of the wise and the foolish virgins. But this, these periods, including the 2520, are important for us because the symbol of God's promise of restoration, or 220, is contained when we have the 2520, the 2300, the 1260, the 1290, and the 1335 as a unit. Now, what name is applied by Daniel to the 2300? Have you ever considered this? What is he told this vision is? The evening and the morning. The morning and the evening. The evening and morning, yes. But let's, let's look at it this way. Daniel 8.26 tells us this. And the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told, is true. So if the evening and morning is the vision that is true, is this not being called out as being separate from the seven times, even though it is a portion of the seven times? For here we are. We have on the 1843 chart, 677 as the beginning point. 
we come down to 457, 220 years later, as the beginning of the 2300. All of these are interconnected. All of these have relation to the present truth movement. How can we then be applying all of these within how we are looking at these various verses to determine the importance for us today? So Smith asked this question. The reading of the Septuagint seems to look very plainly in this direction. Go thy way and rest, but there are yet days and seasons to the full accomplishment of these things. And thou shalt stand in thy lot at the end of the days. This certainly carries the mind back to the long period contained in the first vision in relation to which the subsequent instructions are given. Smith wants to say the 2300 is the period in the first vision, but sets aside the fact that this is the calzone. The 2300 is the vision that is true. The 2300 is the mare. The mare and the mara combined give us the calzone. Because how can you have a sanctuary prepared for worship and not have a people that are restored to God? Any thoughts? Now, Smith had continued, the 2300 days, as has already been shown, terminated in 1844 and brought us to the cleansing of the sanctuary. How did Daniel at this time stand in his lot? In the person of his advocate, our great high priest, as he presents the cases for the righteous for acceptance to his father. Does this seem to be a proper premise for what we have been studying? Smith continues, the word here translated lot does not mean a piece of real estate, a lot of land, but the decisions of chance or the determinations of providence. Is there anything of God that is of chance? <clears throat> no. Mm -hmm. At the end of the days, the lot, so to speak, was to be cast. Now, I'm looking here just, just to verify part of this. Because Daniel 12, 13, if we are looking at this currently, lot, the Hebrew word, comes from the Hebrew 1486, from an unused root meaning to be rough as stone, properly a pebble, that is a lot, small stones being used for that purpose, figuratively a portion or a destiny. I don't know where he's getting this as being a chance. In other words, a determination was to be made in reference to those who should be accounted worthy of a possession in heavenly inheritance. And when Daniel's case comes up for examination, he is found righteous, stands in his lot, is assigned a place in the heavenly Canaan. When Israel was about to enter into the promised land, the lot was cast and the possession of each tribe was assigned. The tribes thus stood in their respective lots long before they entered upon the actual possession of the land. Now, is Smith's explanation seeming to be in agreement with Scripture, or is this setting aside and destroying the verse? Because he seems to be making a literal application of this on Daniel's behalf. Or maybe some kind of example illustrate or you know, something okay it's making an illustration but does this illustration seem to agree with what we're reading in this verse no because he he's making it literal with almost almost uh well not literal but okay I'm not sure i'm not sure what it is i'm looking at it the that smith is actually kind of stretching this verse and he's applying something here that the verse does not seem 
to to have. But I'm also struck by the fact that this this number lot, if you rearrange the numbers from 1486, you can come up with 1864. 1864 being the first full year of the emergence of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Ah, it's interesting. So now, there will be more for us to consider tomorrow. We've looked at this with Smith. This is all from Daniel and Revelation. There's basically 12 pages that we went through. Now, I find Smith's closing remarks to be interesting, where he states, we draw the study of this prophecy to a close with the remark that it has been with no small degree of satisfaction that we have spent what time and study we have on this wonderful prophecy and in contemplating the character of the most beloved of men and most illustrious of prophets. Nice words, but no small degree of satisfaction would bother me because there is so much that is here that is yet even today to be unpacked. I agree. So these things need to be considered so that when we assemble again together and we begin using the document, the working paper, as Theodore has been putting it together, that we can give other consideration to that which we need to understand to better apply this to the current movement as it is. So as we prepare to close, do you have any other thoughts, comments, or questions on what we've just covered? Not for me. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father, thank you for showing us that we need to better apply ourselves to understand all that you would have us to understand at this time. Be with us now. Please guide us and direct us so that our consideration through this day may be upon the subjects that you would have us to deal upon. May your will be done. We ask for your protection upon those that are driving, those that are traveling, and for your watch care over us all. For this we thank you, for this we praise you, now and always, in Jesus' name, amen.